Zimbabwe's teachers demand to be paid in U.S. dollars. We'll explain why. A new solar power system empowers refugees in Kenya. And soft loan firms seek to close the credit gap for Nigerian entrepreneurs. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Tonight we begin in Somalia where the death toll from Friday's car bomb blast in Mogadishu has climbed to 52 according to admission records from five local hospitals. Doctors and administration of administrators of the five hospitals in the city that mainly treat the victims of gunshots and explosions say 106 people are wounded. The blasts which occurred within minutes of each other targeted Mogadishu's Sahafi Hotel and its surroundings. The hotel is near the headquarters of the Somali Police Forces Criminal Investigations Department. Security officials who responded to the attack say four militants entered the hotel and went to the roof and started firing on people down below. Authorities say the security forces eventually killed the assailants and rescued dozens of people from hotel rooms. The terrorist group Al-Shabaab, which has waged an insurgence inside Somalia for more than 10 years, has claimed responsibility. An Ebola outbreak in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has killed nearly 200 people. More than 300 Ebola cases have been confirmed since the outbreak began in August. That's according to the country's Ministry of Health. Containing the outbreak is proving to be difficult because the disease has spread in a conflict zone where dozens of armed groups operate. Aid agencies have been forced to suspend or slow down their work on several occasions. Medical workers in the DRC have lots of experience dealing with the deadly disease. A new vaccine has shown it can protect people who have come into contact with Ebola victims and more people are learning techniques to keep the virus from spreading. However, old problems persist with every outbreak. Some people still refuse to believe Ebola exists and are hiding infected family members. Traditional barrier practices also are putting people at risk. The health ministry says half of the cases are in Beni, a city of 800,000 people in North Kivu province. The results of the Ebola epidemic in northern Kivu and Ituri province have surpassed that of the first epidemic in history of our country, which occurred in 1976 in Yambaku in the Equatorial province. At this point, 319 cases and 198 deaths have been registered. In view of these figures, my thoughts and prayers go to the hundreds of families grieving and to the hundreds of orphans and their families who have been wiped out. Well, in Congo politics, the opposition coalition has chosen businessman and lawmaker Martin Fayulu to be its candidate in December's presidential election. The announcement was made in, on Sunday in Geneva. If election stays on track, it will be Congo's first peaceful change of power since independence from Belgium in 1960. Uh, Fayulu will face President Joseph Kabila's preferred successor from the ruling party, Emmanuel Ramazani Shidari, in the December 23rd vote. Picking a unified candidate, at least, uh, gives the opposition someone to rally around. Uh, several prominent opposition leaders, including former Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba and millionaire businessman Moise Katumbi, are barred from, by authorities from running. Positions the opposition accused of being politically motivated. A July opinion poll taken before Kabila publicly announced he was supporting Ramazani showed opposition leaders were favored by about 70% of voters. However, the ruling party enjoys significant financial and institutional advantages. We're now to Southern Africa, where teachers in Zimbabwe's capital are demanding to be paid in U.S. dollars, the most desired form of currency in the economically struggling country. The educators staged a one-day strike on Friday to amplify the demands. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare. <laughs> Zimbabwe's teachers want President Emerson Nangagwa's government to pay them in U.S. dollars as they agreed in 2009. During the last few years, these teachers have been receiving salaries in local currencies which have lost more than 75% in value since their introduction two years ago. We have come here, we have raised our issues. 
and we know wherever they are, they will ask what we will say. And they will be told by their intelligence networks. They also get to see our letters, whether they get them from the social media or they get them from the mainstream media. So we should be inspired by what we have. The dispute is being felt here in the rural areas where teachers cannot access their money and have to grapple to acquire the basics. The Amalgamated Rural Teachers Union of Zimbabwe says the situation on the ground is really bad and the government must work towards resolving their plight. We want the government to attend to our issues, basically to do with the issues of wages, the issue of savings, because we want salaries which are above the poverty data line. We want the salaries which are in US dollars as we negotiated. The marching teachers tried to get a meeting with Zimbabwe's Minister of Finance, Mutuli Nguwe, but to no avail. They did manage to enter the Premier Medical Aid Society, which is responsible for government workers' medical treatment. Arthur Choga, the spokesman of the organization, says the teachers are free to express themselves. Choga says, his organization will continue engaging with them. The Zimbabwean president and his advisors have tried to assure Zimbabweans the economy is stable as prices continue to climb and citizens are worried about their own economic futures. Columbus Mavunga, Kofiwe News, Harare. Well, in northern Kenya's Kakuma refugee camp, new solar power systems are changing people's lives and give, giving them a chance to earn money by providing services to other refugees. As Mohammed Yusuf reports, solar panels are the fastest growing source of renewable energy. Jerome Busuka fled the Democratic Republic of Congo and found safety in a refugee camp in northern Kenya and a job in this barber shop. Solar power provides electricity that makes his work and his income possible. I like my work, but it would not be possible without electricity. And here in Kakuma, there would be no electricity without solar power. World Bank figures show six out of ten people living in sub-Saharan Africa have no electricity, and the situation is even worse in rural areas. That is changing, according to the International Energy Agency, which says the use of solar panels to generate electricity is expected to grow faster than all other renewable power technologies combined. Clean, reliable and affordable power has opened doors for many refugees, extending hours for studying and working, and providing opportunities to start businesses. I said if I start at all, then I buy some touches, I start charging the phone 10 shillings, so it, it means most of the people will come to me, then I'll charge the phone, then I'll get that m amount. That's how the business idea came into my mind, because of the power. Because I saw in the community there is no power. Since I installed a solar system at home, I have seen a lot of difference in my family. My children can study. We don't have to go far to charge the phone and the radio. We do everything at home now. Bbox is a UK-based off-grid power company. The company was set up in 2010 and has since sold 150,000 of its solar home systems. The system allows customers without access to electricity to power lights and small appliances. And this is the second level. As a, as a business that is investing on solar energy, so we look at Kakuma as like a potential market because there's no electricity grid, that's one thing. And there's not a lot of in, in investors from the solar companies. And we have a good population of people who are in need of lightning. Kakuma refugee camp is home to at least 140,000 refugees. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Kakuma, Kenya. A university in London is looking at new ways to use technology that displays fully three-dimensional images. They are hoping academics and experts can use the technology to deliver lectures in the classroom remotely. Here's viewers Maria Medell. In what's believed to be a first, London's Imperial College Business School is using holographic technology to present lectures to students. From California, Marilee Nika, Google's product manager, was beamed onto a stage like magic. Can you see me? Yeah. 
The head of Imperial's EdTech Lab says this presents a window to the world. Through holograms, we can bring in lecturers from um, across the globe and they can appear in front of our students in a realistic manner. That's the key. The developer of the technique explains how it works. We're presenting a 2D image as a 3D image. And um, the iris is flat. So we see everything in 2D, our brain changes it to 3D. So we're doing exactly the same trick. We're presenting a 2D image, but with depth of field and a really good vision, our brain just changes it to 3D. Underlying how clothes were made. Attendees say there are many ways this tool can help educators and students. With time differences, for example, Asian students, it's not so easy to catch up a lecture in the, in the US, for example. Uh, the second thing we could do with that is have CEOs come into the classroom and engage with students. And the third way probably is maybe have Albert Einstein coming into the classroom. There might be a long wait for that. Meanwhile, master's student Josephine Collin says she prefers the interaction a hologram lecture offers compared to those presented online. I wouldn't mind it, and I think it's really interesting if we, if we can have access to different lecturers and different like, guest speakers. Thanks to that technology, that's something I would definitely enjoy. So. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Developers say the cost of holographic technology has dropped considerably since the days it was used mostly in big-budget music shows, making it possible for educational institutions to afford it. Maria Madialo, VOA News. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. During the conversation on Facebook, the address is uh, um, the address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Well, find me on Twitter at VA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, helping small business owners in Nigeria fulfill their dreams. But first, a look at Monday's headlines. In Mozambique, the main opposition party announces its national council will hold a congress to elect the successor to its late leader, Afonso Lakama, who died in May. The names will come out in, the in Zimbabwe, the opposition MDC alliance says the government tried and failed to abduct its leader, Nelson Chamisa, a claim the government denies. In France, Ivory Coast President Alassane Ouattara met with French President Emmanuel Macron on Monday on the sidelines of the Paris Peace Forum. A Christian foundation in Gambia plans a shelter for Christian converts, some whom they say have been persecuted after leaving the country's majority Muslim faith. Finally, Uganda holds its first ever beauty contest for people with albinism. Fires continue to rage and devastate both ends of the western U.S. state of California. On Monday, with the deadly infernos being barely contained amid strong winds and dry conditions, the death toll stands at 31 and is likely to increase as rescue workers reached vast regions left in churred ruins. More than 8,000 firefighters are battling the so-called campfire in Northern California. And the Woodsley Fire and Hill Fire in the uh, Southern uh, California, authorities say 29 people have been killed in, in the massive campfire with 228 people still unaccounted for. Thousands of people have evacuated with what little of their lives possessions they could escape with. Uh, well, first, we're so thankful for how the communities come together. Uh, it's been a major blessing, but this isn't a one-day thing. Uh, this is long-term, and we have to think that way. Uh, so food is going to continue to run out. So will supplies. We keep needing that. We definitely need medical supplies and medical professionals. Uh, a lot of our elderly are on oxygen, and that's running out quickly. 
Well, two people have been killed in the Woosley fire in Southern California. The blaze is threatening about 75,000 homes in Ventura County, northwest of Los Angeles, near where 12 people were killed in mass shooting last week. Now, the mayor of the city of Thousand Oaks, where the mass shooting took place, it says three, th three quarters of the city is under fire evacuation orders. Uh, officials say the campfire has destroyed over 6,000 homes and has grown to 404 square kilometers, making it the most destructive wildfire in California history. Well, residents in the United States still recovering from two mass shootings in as many weeks. One at a synagogue in the eastern city of Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, and the most recent one on the west coast at a bar in a suburb, uh, suburban neighborhood near Los Angeles. Near, uh, now, for a new generation of students growing up in America, mentally preparing for a mass shooter event is now a fact of life for many. Viewers Elizabeth Lee reports. First. Candlelight vigils have become all too familiar images in the United States. The shooting in Thousand Oaks, California means reliving a nightmare for Kayla Sanford, who survived the mass shooting in Las Vegas, Nevada in 2017. I've lived a year now through it. Um, I guess this just really hits home for me. Um, I can't, you know, I can't imagine what these people are going through. I've been to this bar many, many times. I love college nights. On her way to give blood, she never expected another mass shooting would happen so close to home. It doesn't get easier to hear, but it, it gets more normalized. It's desensitized completely. At the same time, it haunts her. Um, I think twice about going anywhere, <laughs> honestly. Um, not just here, I mean, the grocery store, the, the mall. From a shooting at a bar in California, to a Jewish synagogue in Pennsylvania, to a school in Texas, all these mass shootings happened within a year. To live in a constant state affair, that is terrorism. That's what terrorism is. And um, I think that this ne needs to be called exactly that. You know, we are living in a state of fear within our own country, within our own borders, amongst ourselves. Grace Fisher showed up to the scene of the Los Angeles area shooting, demanding action on gun control. Fisher says she fears for her own children. Some people are like, oh, it's another mass shooting. And it's disgusting. You know, I'm sick to my stomach every time it happens because I sit there and I empathize and I put myself in those kids' shoes, in the parents' shoes, and I say, like, how could they think say goodbye to their child and say goodnight to their child, like, and then wake up and find out that they may not be coming home ever? Um, and that's not okay. And all these kids who have been killed in schools. Parents and teachers now have to have those conversations with kids who are in school. And what are you going to do if this happens? You know, what do you, what is your plan? Where are you going to go? What do you, and they, they shouldn't have to worry about that. I think that the problem in this country is multifaceted. It's going to take a multifaceted approach to solve this problem. Um, but to say that guns are not the problem is a total cop out. As Americans deal with mass shootings through activism or caution, they adapt to this new reality and many will teach their children to do the same. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News, Los Angeles. U.S. President Donald Trump wrapped up his visit to France on Sunday after attending events commemorating the end of World War I a hundred years ago. In addition to participating in the Amistice Day ceremony in Paris with about 70 other world leaders, Trump visited an American military cemetery outside Paris before flying to, uh, back to the United States. As viewers Lighted to Hope reports, Trump's visit was marked by some controversy. President Trump on Sunday visited an American cemetery west of Paris to pay tribute to U.S. servicemen who died in the Great War. Each of these marble crosses and stars of David marks the life of an American warrior. Great, great warriors they are, who gave everything for family, country, God, and freedom. Through rain, hail, snow, mud, poisonous gas, bullets, and mortar, they held the line 
and pushed onward to victory. Trump's words follow a barrage of criticism he received for canceling a Saturday trip to another American cemetery in France due to inclement weather. Earlier Sunday, French President Emmanuel Macron led a procession of dignitaries to Arc de Triomphe in Paris to pay respect to the millions who died in the conflict. Ne peut être celle de la rancœur d'un peuple. The lesson of the Great War cannot be that of resentment between peoples, nor should the past be forgotten. It is our deeply rooted obligation to think of the future and to consider what is essential. Trump's reunion with Macron this weekend started on a less cordial note than on previous occasions, following Macron's statement that Europe needs its own army to protect itself against China, Russia, and even the United States. Trump called the remark insulting, while Putin remained unflapped. I think this process is positive on the whole from the point of view of strengthening the multipolar nature of the world. In this regard, our position coincides with France. Trump and Macron later said they both want strong Europe. In an interview aired by the CNN network on Sunday, Macron explained his vision. What I don't want to see is um, European countries increasing the budget in defense in order to buy Americans and other arms or, or, or materials coming from your industry. I think if we increase our budget is to have to build our autonomy and to become an actual sovereign power. On Sunday afternoon, the French president hosted a peace conference for about 60 world leaders in Paris. Despite rain, a large number of demonstrators gathered to protest the event. The goal of this demonstration is that it should not just be accepted that Macron can invite Trump, Putin, Netanyahu and say, I am holding the peace summit in Paris because it is not a peace summit, it is a war summit. Trump was heading back home when the event started. Zlatis Ahok, VOA News, Washington. Well, Washington is adjusting to an impending power shift after Democrats won control of the U.S. House of Representatives in last week's midterm elections. VOA's Mike Bowman tells us Democrats are promising to hold President Trump accountable and protect the Justice Department's Russia probe, but also stressing the need to deliver tangible results that address the everyday concerns of the American people. Beginning in January, House Democrats will have sweeping powers to investigate the Trump administration. But Democrats slated to lead key committees are promising judicious use of that power. I'm not going to be handing out subpoenas like uh, somebody's handing out uh, candy on Halloween. We got a lot to do. So I, I'm laser focused, laser focused on those issues that even President Trump says that he wants to work on, such as uh, prescription drug prices. Even so, more congressional scrutiny of the Trump administration is on the way. We will hold the president accountable. He will learn that he is accountable, that he's not above the law. Trump says he is not worried about what House Democrats will do. They can look at us, then we can look at them, and it'll go back and forth. Then it's just all it is is uh, a warlike posture. Democrats are blasting Trump's pick to lead the Justice Department after firing Attorney General Jeff Sessions last week. Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker has repeatedly criticized special counsel Robert Mueller's probe of Russian election meddling and possible collusion by Trump's inner circle. His appointment is simply part of an attack on the investigation by Robert Mueller, the special counsel. It's part of a pattern of interference by the president. Senate Democrats and a few Republicans are renewing a push for legislation to make it harder for the White House to dismiss Mueller, insisting the probe must be completed. Now, more than ever, a functioning democracy requires Democrats and Republicans to come together to take action next week to protect special counsel Mueller's investigation. Because if we don't, and Donald Trump is given license to shut down an investigation into his own potential wrongdoing, then our nation starts to devolve into a banana republic. The Senate's top Republican says Trump is no threat to Mueller's work. It's never been any indication that he wants to dismiss 
uh, the, the Mueller or the investigation. The White House, meanwhile, flatly denies that any collusion with Russia or obstruction of justice took place. We've already been very compliant with the Mueller investigation. 1.4 million pieces of paper produced, 33 and counting individuals who either have been interviewed or asked to produce information. Hands off Mueller! Hands off Mueller! Progressive activists are pressing for impeachment of Trump. But top House Democrats insist such talk is premature and that any steps to sanction the president must be carefully weighed and supported by concrete evidence. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Celebrating the opening of their new restaurant in Los in Lagos, the Igwe twins finally have a solution to make their business dream a reality. They had struggled to find a startup loan, which is often a common predicament in sub-Saharan Africa. Around 80% of adults in that region have no bank accounts and struggle to access finance from banks reluctant to lend to new customers. Now, the, two, the twin solution came in the form of uh, rent money. Uh, it's a Nigerian microfinance bank that offers offers collateral free cash loans of up to 4 million naira, that's about 10,000 US dollars. Uh, corruption, red tape and mismanagement make Nigeria one of the toughest countries in which to operate as a business owner. Well, next up, uh, Britain's Prince William warned that the clock is ticking towards a tipping point when our impact on the environment will be irreversible. Uh, the Duke of Cambridge made the comments at uh, uh, ta uh, the task conservation award ceremony where he presented awards to three people uh, for conservation work and protection of Africa's wildlife and natural heritage. Uh, the prince attended the awards at uh, Whitehall's uh, banqueting house along with his wife Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge. Tusk, a charity focused on protecting African wildlife, was set up in 1990. Prince William became a patron of it 2005 and has continued to support the charity in public and in private visiting its projects in Tanzania, Namibia, and Kenya in recent months. Well, and finally, with people's life expect expectancies growing, the luxury accommodation market for the over 65s is booming. One of the most expensive residential homes in the world is being built in London with lavish spas, restaurants, and multi-million pound apartments. Uh, the UK has experienced steady improvements in life expectan expectancy throughout the 20th century. The Office uh, for National Statistics recently, uh, rather currently puts UK life expectancy at 79.2 years for men and 82.9 years for women. With more years to enjoy one's retirement, people are increasingly looking towards fancier living options in their latter years rather than opting for a traditional old people's home. Uh, this is part of a wider trend of retirees moving from the suburbs back to the city. And that's what is trending. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. in a minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my